Why perfect compliance is the enemy of good Kubernetes security. I, all, I have regretted that title so many times, you know, when I rehearsed the talk, because it's really a mouthful. I say it like five times really fast. I'm Michelle Chaburka. I'm a cloud security advocate at Google. And I really do appreciate you being here because this is like one of the last sessions of the day and it shows real commitment to Kubernetes security. <laughs> okay. I just want to let you know, I'm not going to go into nauseating, excruciating detail about Kubernetes controls. You've probably seen a lot of those talks here today or over the last few days. Um, and there are lots of great books and, and blogs and websites. I'm really going to focus on um, architecture principles because I think that's where you get a lot of bang for your buck. And guess what? I'm an ex-architect. <laughs> so compliance. I know, I know. Overwhelming, right? All these different, this is just a few of them, right? All these different standards and frameworks. How many people have to deal with regulatory frameworks like bank frameworks? Oh yeah, PCI DSS, do we have any of those in here? Up. Oh, yep, got some PCI, great. NIST, NIST, yep, okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, I have circled the Center for Internet Security CIS benchmarks because that's probably what everybody has to deal with the most, right? Um, you know, that's what the dashboards and all the commercial tools actually use. KubeBench uses the CIS benchmarks um, for Kubernetes. Uh, like most of the CNAP, all the CSPM tools, they use uh, the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks under the hood. And what's great about it is it's this great uh, uh, organization. It's a, a nonprofit organization that brings uh, vendors or open source um, product teams with the community and they advocate to come up with hardening standards, right? Now, I don't recommend you read the, <laughs> the benchmarks yourself unless you have insomnia because like the Kubernetes one is about 300 pages, but you get the idea. Um, this is really, I'm going to teach you how to crack compliance, not by gaming it, but really compliance should be a continuous kind of improvement exercise, right? Um, it's never really done. You don't just do it and then you're like, hey, I'm PCI. It's always continuous. You gotta come back to it every year. But in theory, you should be trying to work on it as you're going through um, the maintenance on your platform, your Kubernetes platform. That's what's gonna make you successful. Okay. I'm going to TLDR this for you, but if you want to take pictures of the quote, this is my favorite, this is my favorite quote from the SABSA Security Architecture Framework book. I do not expect you to buy that book. It can kill bugs, though, if you're looking for that. Um, but basically, the authors compare security to the brakes on a car. You don't, when you, your brakes uh, don't feel like they prevent you from going forward, do they? It gives you the confidence to move forward at, at velocity. And it's a, so it's a feature. All of a sudden, it, it actually helps you. And that's really how you should look at security on your platform. Think about how it's going to give you that confidence and that safety and those guardrails. Security control domains. I'm going to tell you how to talk to security people. And security people, I'm sorry, I'm going to like make it hard, you know, I'm going to give away your secrets. <laughs> but um, security programs are based on something called uh, control domains. They don't always call it that, but they break up the different um, domains into, the, into discrete areas, right? And um, like the banks usually call it control domains. But this is the NIST cybersecurity framework, and you see it's pretty easy to understand, identity, protect, re detect, respond, recover. Um, they describe exactly what they are. And what that means is, so identify, that's like finding your assets and your resources, right? And, you know, protect, and then you want to protect them and then detect things against them. But understanding this, this idea of control domains will help you organize your efforts. Because now what you should do is, oh, I need to have some, a control that meets this. Because your GRC, your governance, risk, and compliance team are going to come to you and ask you about all of these. So whatever they're using, go figure it out <laughs> and then align your efforts with that. Figure out who the leads are for each of these areas and then go talk to them. 
and start mapping out your controls. Because, yeah, they have all these cool new GRC tools that use AI and like um, will help and, cre and track this stuff online in a continuous compliance fashion. But ultimately, you need to make sure that your controls map into that, right? And then you can identify any gaps that you have. But this is the way to do it um, because guess what happens? Anybody recognize this? Yeah, sure, right? Yeah, PCI DSS, um, prioritized approach tool. And I love how they call it a tool and it's a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's an Excel spreadsheet. But you know what? Um, I mean, I don't know if I encourage you to read PCI DSS, but this is a great tool for understanding the detailed controls that the QSA or your ISA is going to look for. So it's a great tool in that sense. And um, the Cloud Security Alliance also has the cloud control matrix, which maps all the different standards against each other. So let's say you're not sure if a new one's going to come up. You could just focus on what, how they break it up into control domains. And then all you have to do is you gather your, you make sure, oh, am I doing this? Am I doing that? And then you hand it to somebody. You hand it to the GRC person and they're going to love you, right? Because that's the way to do it. You want to build that relationship and, because this is a very difficult activity <laughs> to, to manage all the time. Okay, some key security principles. And why am I teaching these key security principles? Because it's not really effective for you to get caught up in uh, this checkbox compliance attitude. Some programs start that way. A lot of platform um, security starts that way. But what you're going to find is it's, it's defeating. You feel like you start to feel like a hamster in a wheel. Um, it then turns into a little bit of security theater where it's meaningless. But that's not really what you want. You want real security, right? We all want that. So my recommendation is that you focus on key security principles and architecture. And then what happens is you inevitably hit compliance. Spoiler. Um, so what are some of those key security principles? And I apologize for any of you who may already know this. Um, so access control. I have a very simple definition for that. The intersection of identity and data governance. Who is going to get to what? That's it. That's all it is. Pretty simple, except the solutions, the controls are pretty complex. Then there's immutability and ephemerality, right? That's a key foundational concept in uh, Kubernetes and cloud native. It means the workloads are unchanging and they're short lived. However, there are exceptions to that. There are some uh, data science use cases with like notebooks where people are interacting with them and they're not short lived necessarily. You know, you want to focus, don't get too caught up in that. I remember a case where um, there was this data science product that was using Kubernetes in this really clever way as an orchestration tool because the installation of the product was that complex. And I was like, it's not cloud native. Talk to the hand. Oh, I'm not doing it. And then as I realized, oh, they're just being clever with the use of Kubernetes. This is a different use case. And I changed my mind. Um, I don't know if that happens with many security people, but <laughs> I did. OK, then there's this idea of least privilege. And you should start a drinking game or something, because I'm going to say least privilege a lot here today. And all that means is that you assign the least amount of access needed for a principal or in an environment, right? Separation of duties, it's adjacent to least pri privilege, right? And that means that you limit the sets of permissions to ensure that no single principal can abuse a system, right? It means that you're limiting, you're trying to control blast radius and lateral movement. You'll hear that from security people a lot, right? We love those terms, that and the intrusion kill chain. Um, then you have this idea of defense in depth, right? You're applying multi multiple controls in layers so that if one fails, you have backups. And you want to hear my defense in depth joke? Ready? It's really bad. Um, security is like an onion. That's why it makes you cry. Thank you. I'm here all night. <clears throat> OK. Cloud native security model, the four C's. I did not invent this, but it's brilliant. Um, and this is a mental model for how you will uh, create your threat model or how you think about your attack surface. 
And remember how I said defense in depth, right? It's layers, right? You're, you're adding controls at each one of these layers. So there's the code layer. What's a code? You, your static application security testing. Your SCA, your software composition analysis that looks for uh, bad dependencies in libraries, right? Um, linting, fuzzing. Then you have container. Now, you also have dependency checking in your container security tools. But that's duplicative, right? Oh, defense in depth. That, yeah, duplicate controls, that's okay. Then you have the cluster. Okay, what's your runtime security tool? What's your, uh, have you hardened your Kubernetes platform? And then the cloud. What, how are you checking your infrastructure's code? How are you, um, you know, monitoring for your, your cloud platform for uh, events and incidents? Does that make sense? Everybody following that model? It's a really good model. Okay, these are just some of the architectural and security concepts that I'm gonna talk about. Okay, I am known for my identity stuff. <laughs> I know I sound like a broken record sometimes. Um, identity is like the first, and it's the first thing that you have to get right, and if you don't, um, it's really gonna screw you over. <laughs> it's really gonna make your life miserable. It's hard to fix once you, you mess it up. And consider two primary identities in Kubernetes, the interactive and the non-interactive. So you have the humans, like the admins and the developers, and then you have the non-interactive, the, the workloads, the service accounts, right? And consider that many of the items in the benchmark are about authentication, am I who, am I who I said I am? and authorization, auth Z. What do I have access to? Like if you go through that, you're gonna see a ton of auth N and auth Z. And why do we call it auth N and auth Z? Because we're too lazy to say the extra syllables. Yes. God, these jokes are like not doing well here today. Um, so you wanna design your identity certificate and credential management to support a lot of the principles that I talked about in the previous slide, right? Okay, some of the considerations. Ugh, RBAC, oh my God. Least privilege and RBAC. It seems so easy on paper. We're just, you know, security will go, come to you and say, okay, configure granular RBAC profiles. You go, okay. Well, hey, Mr. IAM team or Mrs. IAM team, are you gonna help me with that? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't know Kubernetes, that's not our problem. We have our stuff. Oh, hey, security person, are you gonna help us configure this? We don't know, no. We're security engineering, we don't know Kubernetes, we're not gonna do that, just do it right. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> so you gotta figure this part out, because if you don't get this right, I have literally sat in meetings, <laughs> like platform meetings, where we're working out the design and stuff, and nobody will do the RBAC stuff. Like nobody will do it. And it just, just dies right there. Okay, um, don't mix interactive and non-interactive identities, right? So you don't wanna give a non-interactive profile to like a, a human being, you know, the same as with cloud. You don't wanna do that. Just remember that Kubernetes is a big a API, right? And it depends on auth N and auth Z. So here's another, problem that I've seen a lot. Um, certificates. Yeah. If you're in a, a somewhat of a large organization or even a medium-sized organization, you generally have some people who manage the certificates in your org, right? Does everybody have like a certificate management team? Yeah. Okay. A lot of people do, right? So if you tell them, oh no, I want to do, I want to be a private CA or I want my Kubernetes platform, I want you to delegate to me. What do you think that security team says? I can tell you what, <laughs> what they said when I was there. They're like, hell no, 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 no. Separation of duties, least privilege. No, you can't, ha you can't do that. And then you go to them and you say, well, do you support automation? Do you support the ACME protocol in your certificate system? Pfft, no, just use the portal and manually request them. But that screws over your entire like, desire to have automation and just-in-time certificates, right? So guess what? You're gonna have to like, negotiate that. You're gonna have to talk to people, work that out, or your Kubernetes cluster is dead on arrival. 
It's done. Then Kubernetes secrets versus vaulting. How many people have died on this hill? I have seen this also kill efforts to use like OpenShift or Kubernetes clusters. What happens is you go, well, I'm going to use Kubernetes secrets because it's encrypted at rest, but it's not centralized. So separation of duties, least privilege. So your security team comes and says, no, you're not. You're going to use a vaulting solution. We have one, but it doesn't support automation. <laughs> so you go, well, are you going to build one? Yeah, maybe. It's not funded. Maybe in a year. So now do you have to own it? You're going to have to stand up a vaulting solution. I've actually been in places where they didn't support the cloud provider's vaulting solution because it was a bank and you had to have a list of approved products. Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> so another important topic is multi-tenancy and resource segregation. So I have actually seen, again, like I've been around tables, like four hour meetings where they tried to decide how they were going to segregate lines of business from each other on the, in Kubernetes. I mean, that's a big topic. Even if you're, it's not for customers, if you're not a SaaS application, you're going to have to segregate your internal customers, right? So you want to base your design on trust boundaries. And trust boundaries, for people who don't know what that is, that means that's a, a privilege shift. Um, in the environment, in the architecture, right? So you have PCI, for example, and non-PCI workloads, or you have internal and external, right? You know, DMZs, that's an, that harkens to the past, right? Um, so remember, I said access control is the intersection of identity and data governance. Also, the data that an application touches, that determines its security posture. That's a very common thing in, in GDPR, for example, but that, like, if your application handles PII, that sends it all the way up to a high-risk security posture. Because what we're seeking to do in security is minimize the risk of lateral movement. We want to reduce the blast radius in the event that one tenant is compromised. That's the goal. So that's what you have to consider. Um, you want to identify your requirements for hard versus soft multi-tenancy. And that will often depend on your auditor or your assessor. Um, you know, you say, oh, I can use namespaces and some of this stuff. And they go, no, 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 separate clusters. Banks will often use separate clusters. I don't want to tell you how many clusters we had at one bank that I used. <laughs> it was a lot. They were a lot. Um, so what are some of the considerations? Okay. Treat the control plane as a tenant. Because you don't want, in a container escape, you don't want your control plane compromised, right? So you want to treat that separately. You want to isolate those. You want to use tools like separate clusters where appropriate, node isolation through you know, steering. And you want to use namespaces, network policies. You can use container sandboxing. Yay, Gvisor. Kata containers. Um, you can use mandatory access control, uh, C groups. Why would you see groups really, it doesn't sound like it's a security tool, but it is because, you know, you don't, you want to restrict resource availability so that way one tenant can't get DDoSed and cause problems with others, right? Then you want to group pods with similar purposes or access types together. Okay, here is my definition of Kubernetes. <laughs> Ready? It's, uh, it optimizes compute of homogenous applications. So if you think about it that way, you're going to put homogenous applications together. That's the best way to use it. So you want to segregate by data governance profile. Like I said, PCI versus non-PCI. So I don't know if you knew this, for those who don't do PCI, um, if you have one PCI app and like 10 non-PCI apps, guess what happens to everything that's on that platform together? It's all scoped for PCI. And that becomes incredibly more complex and expensive for you to deal with. Um, prod versus non-prod, internal, external. You want to separate clusters by business unit as well. I highly recommend that. For example, if you're a bank and you have an auto loan division and a credit card division, would you put those on the same cluster? I wouldn't. I didn't. I mean, it's really a good idea not to. In fact, 
especially because the business units really don't want you to do that too. If you go to some place like a bank, they'll be like, no, we want our own cluster. We don't want their stuff there, yuck. Um, and then you probably wanna keep customer and internal applications separate, right? Container. Um, so some of you may think, well, the container's not my problem. Somebody else's problem. The container image, that, that's not my problem. It only is my problem when it's the running instance. Well, except that every unnecessary, unnecessary process creates a risk on your platform, right? And a little pet peeve of mine, the running instance is not the same as the container image. Like you'll hear people throw container around and you don't know which one they're talking about. And I get a little, you know, uh, pissy about it just because I like, you know, I'm a security person and that's how we are. Um, just remember that. And why does that matter? Because um, guess who security comes to first when something is uh, compromised, when they see a vulnerability? They go to the Kubernetes platform team first. They don't go hunt down uh, the image people. They don't, they, and often, you don't have the right tools that stitch the running instance and the container image together. So they're going to come to you, and they're going to get you to, to run it down. It sucks, but that's just often the way it happens, right? Just and remember, a container is just a software package, right? That's all it is. Um, this is a very simplified container supply chain, and you'll see how it intersects with the software pipeline. I like to think of, you know, people say, oh, the pipeline usually in organizations, but it's really pipeline of pipelines. That's really what it is, right? So what are some secure container SDLC principles? I am not gonna use that Mm, that supply chain thing, <laughs> because it's really about the software development life cycle, the entire thing. So trust, use a trusted re repository, use a trusted source, um, create trusted images through signing, right? Like cosign, validate. You wanna scan the images, you wanna get a CVSS score, you wanna cryptographically track it so that the security tool, you know, if you're using an admission control from your security tool, um, an admission controller, it can recognize, oh, have I seen that before? Yep, or no, 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 I haven't seen that before. Go get scanned. Um, economize, don't add unnecessary elements. Reduce, follow least privilege. Oh, I said it again, least privilege. Um, limit system syscalls and Linux capabilities. Parameterize, don't hard code configs or secrets. Hopefully this isn't that new to people, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, Immutability, right? Don't add a shell because you're going to cause drift. Don't add curl. You know how many times I've seen curl on container images? You don't want that, right? It encourages really bad behavior. Uh, and then use techniques like distroless, rootless, from scratch. Uh, then you, that way you can eliminate unnecessary layers and privileges. And then automate. I talked to somebody the other day. They were still building containers on, on uh, desktops. That's not the best idea. I wouldn't recommend that. Okay, runtime. Now, I just wanna point out that the biggest bang for your buck is gonna be at image assurance time. Just like anything else, I don't know, if, do you, does everybody know the QA pyramid? Do you know what that is? Oh, it's kinda of old school. Where you do uh, things like, um, you know, sonar cube, linting and stuff like that. You do those kinds of activities at the very bottom the most and the live interactive activities you do the least because it's the most expensive. Like SAST goes at the bottom and, and DAST goes at the top, right? Dynamic application security testing. So, but even though that's the case, you should spend the most time on those, uh, you know, image assurance, no, we're gonna prevent. You will need to still do work at runtime, right? Because Kubernetes is the hall monitor. It's the guardian. And it can enforce all this stuff. It's the last, <laughs> it's the last gate, right? You can enforce immutability and ephemerality. And the majority of, like I said, the majority of Kubernetes security, though, should be focused on the preventative. Um, I'm not going to say that other thing, you know, shift, blah, blah, okay, because I'm sick of it. Um, <laughs> some of the runtime security concerns. You want to choose a container runtime that's supported by your security tools. Like cryo for a long time wasn't supported by a lot of security tools. 
So you want to think about that because you wouldn't want to <laughs> you wouldn't want to go. Oh, we're going to use this, and then the security people go, "No, our tool doesn't work with that." Um, if if you're using SecComp mandatory access control and you're limiting capabilities, you need to consider the impact to your development team. Again, remember I talked about certificates and RBAC and all of that. This is another showstopper. I remember being in a place and they were like, security was like, "You're going to configure SecComp. You're going to configure all this stuff," and the Kubernetes platform guy said, well, who's going to manage that? What happens when it causes a problem? What happens when it breaks a deploy? They were like, I don't know. That's your problem, man. But they didn't, like, they weren't prepared to do the security work, right? Uh, you want to include container, and dr container drift detection and prevention. There are tools to do that. You want to think carefully about it. You may want to give a warning, a long warning period, because if you terminate, you know, pods, that can get pretty ugly for you. I'm just saying, I have been there. I used enforcement before. Um, they, it was the pitchforks and the torches, and they were, yeah. Um, you want to implement um, pre-deploy runtime policies through pod security standards and admission control. And you want to identify, you know, it's people, process, technology, and culture. You want to identify how you're going to move, move from warn audit to enforcement, because that's going to be, that can really break your organization and you will come out looking really bad. <laughs> you don't want that. Uh, so admission control policy criteria. A lot of you may have seen this. I apologize if it's, uh, you know, I'm telling you what you already know. Um, is the image known from a trusted repository? Do you want to use Docker Hub? We used to force, I worked in one place and we only mirrored and you could only pull from a mirror. That was it. That's a good, that, that's a good way to do it. Now you have immediate control. Um, is the image approved? So DevSecOps is not just about, um, oh, we're going we're gonna to throw a bunch of information at you and we did our job. No, no, no. So it's about decisioning, security decisioning in a pipeline. So, and, and essentially, I think of admission control as kind of the end of the pipeline. You know, it's ripe for release. So is the image approved? You have a lot of these security tools, these scanning tools, they will give it a score. They'll give it a CVSS score based on all of the material on the container, right? So they'll give it a score like a 9 or an 8 or a 5. So you need to decide what your release criteria is. When, when am I going to block it? In dev, can they go up to a 9 because it's dev and I don't really care and they're going to work it out? Okay, what about stage? Do I need to make it an 8 or, you know, make it a 7? And then produ production, you say, okay, it can't have anything, or maybe it has to be like a four, you know, under, it has to be under five. But you need to decide that, right? Like, use your release criteria, your general software release criteria as a guidance, as guidelines for that. Don't just like start blocking everything or, you know, not have the conversation. And you should have the conversation with security. Hey, what's allowed? Um, are you gonna break deploys? Okay, I'm worried for you if you're going to break deploys because the developers are going to hate you. Um, what about, I mean, you should. You should let them know if you're going to do it. You know, at, you get a 10. Hey, by the way, you just communicate what the criteria is. They'll, they'll listen to you. They don't want to, they don't want to fight, right? Um, what about image TTLs and expiration of running instances? This can cause a lot of grief too. Okay, how long... Are you going to let running instances run on your platform? A week, two weeks, a month? It depends on your risk tolerance, OK? You need to have that conversation, though. And then the images. How often do you want the images rebuilt? How are you going to force that? OK? These are, you notice that I'm talking more about criteria, and I'm talking less about do it this way. Because there are many ways to skin this cat. You can use any wide array of open source or commercial tooling. You are going to do much better if you focus on the principles and the criteria. That's going to save you. Because then it's like, OK, here's the goal that I want to hit. How am I going to get there? And then you can find a wide array of tools. Um, when the security capability enforces a runtime control, who are you gonna, who's, who's it going to tell? Who's going to deal with it? Who's level two? You got to figure that out. You don't want to figure that out. It's like I always say, um, you know, you don't want to look for the fire extinguisher when there's a fire. 
<laughs> so you want to think about it in the same way. OK, monitoring and logging. Oh, I know, it's so boring, monitoring and logging. But it's important because your SecOps team needs all this information. They build something called playbooks. Have you heard of security playbooks? Like the security people have. But that's what we call when you take a bunch of events and you link them together to decide if it's an incident. When they're talking about playbooks, that's what they're talking about, OK? So they want you to send a lot of different stuff, like these events, to different systems. So you may have um, a syslog system, and then you may have a separate SIM, a security uh, uh, incident and event mo uh, monitor, whatever that stands for. I'm terrible with acronyms. But so you may have two systems. And one does your SRE stuff, you know, that's what it's for. And then the other one is for security. Okay, what are you going to send where? What, the, what level are you going to send? What do they want from you? Do you have a logging policy in your organization? Like, do you know this is broken, like a really mature organization, and this broke a Kubernetes deployment, like in terms of the project. It just stopped it because they wanted to know what logs they, that we needed in security and what levels and everything else, and nobody could tell them. Nobody would tell them. They we're like, no, I'm you. you. Um, so where are you going to log? How do you log? What log level? You can, you can create a DOS situation on your, on your cluster. You can create a DOS on the, you know, for the log destination. You need to figure it out. Where is this going to go? There are lots of ways to answer this, right? You can do it locally. If you're a small organization, you can send it away somewhere. You can use all kinds of tools, right? Security audit records are separate, right? The two main logs, the, the actual logs are system and platform and then application, but then security audit logs are separate. And then you have to choose the level on that. Okay, that's every time the audit logs are every time you interact with the API. How is this data going to be correlated? What's going to do it, <laughs> right? You're going to buy, you know, some commercial tool that has a consumption-based license, and you know who's going to pay for it? And then, what about resource and full metrics? Okay, anybody heard of Conway's law? Do you know Conway's law? Yeah. Okay. Right. So your technology architecture, your technology deployments will mirror your org chart. That's essentially what that is. It's the same with security. How well these people get along, what your policies and standards are like, if you've written them, if you've got a really resilient, you know, well-defined framework. Um, a lot of people don't. Do these people hate each other? Does the CIO and, the, and, and do the CISO and the CIO get along? Or do they hate each other's guts? Okay? I have more than once pulled the, like, you know, crying with the cop to get out of a ticket. I have cried to, like, you know, get them to, you know, the logging team to take the, the Kubernetes cluster logs. They didn't want to take it. They were like, oh, we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be doing containers. I'm like, dude, that ship has sailed, okay? So I'm going to leave you with this final kind of call to action. I really believe in uh, security features as uh, security as a feature of the platform, right? Like when you go buy a car, you don't go, the salesman doesn't go to you and say, oh, do you want seat belts and airbags and all that? That's extra. They don't do that, right? You're, it, safety features are part of the value of the vehicle and you want that, right? Well, it's the same with the platform. You want to have the security as a feature of the platform. I just gave you some ideas and some security principles and some criteria for you to make those good choices. Um, I have this also this notion of, of compliance as property. Instead of disempowering uh, for the security people, instead of disempowering uh, your platform engineers, make them part of the solution. Empower them to help you with this. So where they, it's now their responsibility as much as yours. Negotiate compliance requirements where possible with security teams. You've heard me say that a lot. Um, choose simple, manageable solutions over complex ones. A lot of people really want to jump into service mesh really early and right away, but you've, they still haven't worked out the other stuff. And 
I think service mesh can add a lot of value, but it also adds a lot of complexity. So really make sure you're ready for it. Uh, I know this same, sounds super boring, but uh, racing matrices are really helpful in these situations. So when you know who is responsible, accountable, uh, consulted, and informed, because you don't want to try to figure that out when something bad happens, right? Uh, and then finally, there's this idea of technical challenge versus adaptive challenge, right? Technical is uh, you've you got a flat tire, you change the tire. An adaptive challenge is like a public health crisis, like you know COVID, where you have public health organizations involved, you have uh, you know pharmaceutical companies involved. You know you you have to get all these complex people to work together. And Kubernetes security is complex because the platform is very complex. Okay, and there are some references. My slides are online, and thank you. And since we're the last uh, talk, um, if anybody has any questions, concerns, heckling, Hi. Um, you talked about container risk score. Can you share some best practices how to determine it? What, you mean the vulnerability score? No, the vulnerability, I know. The CVSS is given by the scanner. Yeah. But if you try, like, probably you have hundreds of vulnerabilities in a container. Yeah. Well, no, there really, I hope there aren't. <laughs> probably. There shouldn't be, but yeah. So how do you calculate it to a single score? That's my question. Oh, um, most uh, container security tools are going to uh, give you an overarching score. In my experience, they'll give you one score. Um, if it's an open source tool or if you're trying to combine multiple tools, um, that's more complicated. I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> I would recommend that, oh, I can see, you're probably thinking maybe you scan the S with SCA, a software composition analysis tool, and the container. Um, I would probably stop the build earlier based on the SCA, so it, before it gets to be built into a container, and that, that's how I would solve it. That's how I have solved it in the past. Does that make sense? Stop it early. Like, you know, oh, you don't get to pass go. You do not collect $200. You didn't, you didn't make it here. Remember how it's pipelines of pipelines? They don't get to the container security pipeline. Is that, yeah? OK. I actually have a, a, sort of a quasi white paper. It's on my personal blog, um, DevSecOps Decisioning Principles. I actually wrote about my thoughts about how you're supposed to do this stuff. So feel it's on my postmodern security blog. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. I have just a quick question about uh, threat modeling automation. Uh, because in, in your talk, you talk about threat model. Do you have any idea about how we can improve that and how we can automate that? Oh, you know, I've seen a lot of tools for automating. Th I, I meant automating. If I was unclear, I apologize. I meant automation of the creation of the container. Um, automating threat modeling, in my experience, has been very, very hard because of the, the nature of context. Yes. Um, there are some tools that are starting to try to do that, and okay. with AI, you can probably, with RAG and AI, you can probably do that in some graphing databases. But um, I, uh, I, a lot of like very smart threat modelers that I know, like uh, Robert Hurlbert, um, he, he would disagree with that. I, I actually like um, incremental threat modeling from okay. uh, Irene Michelin, but. Um, yeah, I, I, that's a hard nut to crack right now. Yeah, because behind that, uh, I believe the biggest challenge is we are doing a threat model, for example, in January, but uh, yeah. in June, you know, we will have some drift and how yeah. we can automatically re-update this threat model, yeah. you know, it's... There are tools out there. I don't want to, you know, push a vendor, but I'm happy if you reach out to me, I, okay, I perfect. can mention... I will come to see you. Yeah, yeah. I, there are tools out there. It, it, the tool that you use should be specific to your environment and your processes. I mean, it, it's really dependent on what's going to work for you. Um, honestly, I really like, I'm a big fan of incremental threat modeling. Okay, like when yes. you add a feature, there are tools that can help support that, but you add a feature and then you do a, a little, you know, scope down 
threat model of that new feature or that new that change. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. I will come to see you after the presentation. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Yay, threat modeling, my favorite. <laughs> um, so my question is, who is the audience for your presentation today? Like what persona, what role do you think we play? And then if it's not the compliance security side, because it didn't seem like that to me, it seemed more like to the devs and those people working to deploy things. What resources are out there to help that element? The devs? Get this, no, the security people get oh, the same message. Yeah. Like uh, I you're telling tell you, devs do all these things. Yeah, like, I, yeah. You know, do you know why I do Kubernetes as a security person? You know how I got started doing it? Because nobody else would do it. It's the same reason I started doing security. Um, I was a network engineer way back in the day, and um, <laughs> so network engineers call firewalls routers that don't work. And so they were like, they gave the load balancer and the, and the firewalls to me because they were like, oh, that's a girl, she'll do it. Yeah. And uh, that's also how I got Kubernetes. Like a lot of the security people didn't want to touch it. They thought it would maybe go away. And <laughs> they, they were like, it was really complex and they would, like I left one place and they were still fighting three or four months later, nobody still wanted to take ownership of the, the self-managed on, you know, Kubernetes project. They were still blaming me too for some of the choices I made <laughs> at one place. So how do you do it? You've got to like get the security people to start learning about CI, CD. I, I've actually taught DevOps to security people before and I'm not really like this DevOps platform expert, but they didn't know, they didn't understand it and they didn't want to know. I think it's a question of curiosity, like creating relationships so that, um, <laughs> I wasn't going to say this, but now I'm going to. Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. It's the, the area between what a person can do on their own and what they need help with, like a partnership to, to get better at. And so use that as your guidance. Like you may have to reach out over the divide to have the discussions, right? That's what it's about. That it's that people process and culture thing, right? And um, that's what I did. I mean, I just, they said, what I, well, would you help us? And I'm like, yeah. And I let myself be taught. I wasn't, you know, and I, sometimes I got schooled too. I remember uh, at one place I wanted to use an alpha feature in Kubernetes, and he was like, no. Let me tell you why. <laughs> so, they're gonna kick us out of the room soon, maybe, but I'll, I'll stay here until they can do. <laughs> so, if you have questions. So, what are your thoughts on, you know, a lot of security tools now will give you an exploitability score, right? So, they'll do it. I'm sorry. Uh, like a, an exploitability score. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, this is a fight I've had with our security team pretty yeah. frequently and, and recently. Um, but you know, you have a vulner you may have a high vulnerability. It's not very exploitable. Or if it is, right, we can wrap a compensating control with it, like yeah. additional logging and monitoring. You know, any thoughts there? I mean, it's about managing risk. It's not about eliminating it, right? So yeah, um, exploitability, uh, I, that's called different things from different vendors, right? They've been doing this, some version of that for like 10 years. Uh, I think it depends on your, I think the way you start that is you uh, risk tier your applications. I know, so sounds so boring. Remember how I said it's really super, my version of that is really super easy. You look at, is it an internal or an external application and what classification of data does it process or, or interact with uh, or touch or store? Um, and then that's my formula. So if it's a very high risk tier application external and it's uh, in scope for PCI DSS, maybe I'm not as tolerant of that. Maybe, uh, and remember, a, com a compensating control is above and beyond the expected control, right? So, you know, it, it's, it depends. I'm giving you a very architect response. It depends. <laughs> I'm a cloud architect, so I'm good with that yeah, one. So, okay. Yeah, okay. You know, you're laughing because you know that we do that all the time. Well, it depends. <laughs> Thank you. Is that helpful? Did it help? Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. 
Oh. All right. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I am no security expert in any way, but my, one of my one of the things that just absolutely amazed me was uh, how hard people would work to break into systems, and the ideas that they would come up with that none of the security experts would come up with. Um, the thing that, like, to, to me, I remember, like, the row hammer thing. It was like, what the hell? Yeah, so... So how do you handle the unknown unknowns? Yeah, uh, th that's, like, beyond the scope of this. But um, so don't take it personally. I think that's the first thing. You have to remember most of these... I have a lot of friends who do some of this because I've been around for a bit. You can tell by my LinkedIn profile. And they're, like... They're just, it's just curiosity for the most part, or at least it used to be. And the, you know, the person who works on this um, initially, um, then you get the malicious people who get a hold of it. But it, you can break anything. Anybody can blow up a cathedral, right? It takes a, an army of artisans to build one. So just be prepared for, you know, think of it like an act of God though, or, or a natural disaster. Don't get personally you know, oh, that person, that villain, you know, don't, I, I don't get caught up in that. Um, well, I'm not talking about villainization. I'm talking about the fact that people's human imaginations yeah. are exceeding the walls we can build. Yeah, be prepared for disappointment. I mean, that's just, I, um, yeah, people are going to do terrible things, but, you know, also systems fail for no other reason than of the human, and like the Verizon DBIR says in 68% of the breaches that the cause was human error. Okay. Nobody woke up and said, yay, I'm going to get the system compromised. Right. That's, so you just have to be prepared for bad choices, um, failures and everything else. And you have a defense in depth environment so that if a container is compromised through container escape, okay, you have other controls in place that prevent that full lateral movement. Cause you're, it's gonna happen. Just, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, right? So I just accept it. Okay. Is Thank that you. helpful? Oh no, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just, uh, it's really hard to figure out the unknowns. You don't try. <laughs> you can't. It, it's not a fully deterministic universe, I, not to get philosophical, but yeah. I'm a compatibilist, so I believe in a level of chaos and non-determinism, if you care. All right, one last chance for questions. She's a podcast host, can't you tell? She has that special podcast voice. It's so impressive. <laughs> thank you. I wish Michelle I was on our podcast recently. Would recommend checking out the episode. And thank you so much for coming today. I really do appreciate that you stayed here at this like late hour. That is really great. Thank you, everyone. So props to you.